Well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. What a, what a great honor to be here and to be introduced by an Icelander. There are many wonderful things about Iceland, uh, but I believe the most wonderful is the First Lady, who is a Canadian and a great friend of mine, <laughs> though I've never actually been. So thank you so much uh, for having me here this morning. I bring you greetings from a place far away, a place where people have been settling and building community for thousands and thousands of years. So I start today by saying to all of you, dada nastada, Ambawa stitch, Okinitsugwa. Those are very bad pronunciations of the three indigenous languages uh, in the area that I come from, but the sentiment is the same. It means greetings to all my relations. And I think that's a nice way to start by reminding ourselves that as human beings, as humanity, we are all connected. So this morning, all I want to do with you is I want to tell you some stories. I'm going to tell you four stories, specifically. Three good ones and one bad one. I'm going to tell you a story about myself. I'm going to tell you a story about refugees. I'm going to tell you a story about pluralism under threat. Also a story about myself. And I'm going to tell you a story about a woman I just met whose name is Peace. Let's start with me. My father and mother come from Tanzania, East Africa. And before they had a family, they were working, managing a hotel in the town of Arusha at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro. Arusha then, as now, is used a lot for international conferences. A lot of international aid folks go there. I've always wondered why you know, war crimes tribunals and so on are in Arusha. And when I went to visit uh, with my mother in 2015, I understood. It's because there's a mountain on one side and a jungle with lions on the other. So if you have to sit down and make peace, there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> but when my dad was young, he met a number of Canadian diplomats who had been stationed to Arusha. And those diplomats used to receive Canadian newspapers, specifically the Toronto Star, sent to them by courier. Now, when I tell this story to my students, I'm also a university professor, when I tell this story to my students, I always have to say, a newspaper is sort of like an iPad, but printed, it used to get sent to you. He used to receive the Toronto Star, and my dad was always a voracious reader. And so when the diplomats were done with it, they would give the newspaper to my dad, and he would read and learn about this country on the other side of the world. One day he read an article about the opening of the City Hall in Toronto, which is a really magnificent sort of 1960s building by a Finnish architect. And he thought, he thought to himself, one day I'm going to go to this country and I want to see that City Hall. Some years later, he had the opportunity to travel to London, UK, for his sister's wedding. First time he'd gotten a plane in his life. Since he was getting on a plane anyway, and since Google Maps did not exist, he figured he would go to Canada. I'm not sure he and mom had a sense of the distance involved. But they did. And before they left, my mother figured out that she was pregnant with me. And they decided to go anyway, so I always say that I was born in Canada but made in Africa. And they arrived in Canada. The story that follows is a very typical Canadian story. It's a story of struggle and service. It's a story of hard work and ultimately success. And 38 years after that first plane ride, my father got to sit in a different city hall just two years before he passed, thousands of kilometers away, to see his son sworn in as the mayor. Now, that may sound like an extraordinary story. But the reason that that story is extraordinary is because it is ordinary. It may be extraordinary in its details, but it is ordinary in the story of immigration and migration in Canada. Stories of success and struggle. Now I jumped ahead of myself. 
1989, I was 17 years old. I was in my first year of university at the University of Calgary. I'd finished high school earlier that year. It was indeed an extraordinary year for many reasons. Calgary was basking in the glow of the Winter Olympics that we had held the year before. That spring in May, the Calgary Flames won their first ever Stanley Cup hockey championship. And I'm sad to say their last so far hockey championship. And we were watching with great anticipation what was happening around the world. We seemed to be in a place of incredible openness. We knew that we were in a moment where history was changing. And that's not just because we were 17 years old and you always feel like history is changing. We knew something was happening. Now, of course, many of those hopes were dashed that year on June the 4th, 1989, which was the day when a bunch of students in a square on the other side of the world found themselves brutally massacred. And we asked ourselves, is that openness just a myth? Will the forces that be stamp down on all of us who are trying to move towards a world of more freedom? But then on November 9th, as I was taking first year political science at the University of Calgary, something pretty remarkable happened in this city. And we knew that we were indeed in a place of great change. And in the years that followed, as this city went from division to unity and to freedom, we left, we moved to a different kind of world. As those sledgehammers chopped down that wall at that symbolic moment, I think the world started to say, what comes next? Some very arrogant people in the world said, this is the end of history. Well, that's not exactly what happened. We did move to a world with more access to information, more access to culture, to cultural diplomacy, to new ideas. But for a time, at least, things seemed to be getting better. And in Canada, smug in who we are and what we believe in, we felt a bit like the future of the world. Come to Canada, we would say. Come and see what a post-nationalist country looks like. The Prime Minister, just before the wall came down, who happens to be the father of our current Prime Minister, which is very strange for Canada, by the way, um, enshrined a policy of multiculturalism. He recognized that the strength of our country would come from the interaction of different cultures. So let's come back to me. October 18th, 2010, I was elected mayor, the first Muslim mayor of any major country, of any major city in the Western world. When Sadiq Khan was elected in London and everyone said he was the first Muslim mayor, my Twitter feed blew up with a lot of people going, second, second. That was October 18th, 2010. October 19th, 2010, I suddenly found myself extraordinarily famous. I wasn't expecting that. CNN, the BBC, Time Magazine, Al Jazeera, everyone wanted to talk to me. They didn't want to talk to me about how a nerdy but exceptionally good-looking university professor could become a mayor. <laughs> Fake news. <laughs> they didn't want to talk to me about my thoughts about public transportation and the urban fabric and the future of cities. They didn't even want to talk to me about the color of my skin. They only wanted to talk to me about my faith. And I had a choice at that moment. And my choice was whether or not to indulge in this or whether to, in fact, say, this is not worth it. Because indeed, during that election in 2010, the fact of my faith almost never came up. In fact, during the election, it came up exactly twice. And both times, citizens said, we don't care about that. He grew up here. He knows the city as well as we do. We care about what he wants to do about public transit. We care about his ideas on housing. We care about how he's going to keep our taxes low. And so I had a choice. Would I talk about all of this stuff or would I not? And at that time in 2010, nine years ago, I felt that it was important to tell this story. 
I felt it was important to talk about a place where pluralism works, where multiculturalism works, where the social fabric is one that allows people to be successful. You know, I grew up in a family that didn't have much money, but what I had was extraordinary opportunity. I graduated from great public schools. I would haunt the public library on Saturday afternoons. I would explore the city on public transit. I would learn to swim not very well in a public pool. By the way, I should stop saying that since I now run the public pools and they get offended when I say I didn't learn to swim well. But ultimately, I grew up in a community where people had a stake in my success, and they wanted me to succeed. And I thought that that was a story that was important to tell. Fast forward, 2015. The world is racked by one of the greatest humanitarian crises in history, that being the Syrian refugee crisis. In Canada, we were in the middle of a federal election. And on September the 1st of 2015, a photo was published in newspapers around the world. It was a photo of a little boy in colorful shorts, face down dead, on a beach in the Mediterranean. The little boy's name was Alan Curdy. And that photo hit Canadians harder than just about anyone else. Because it quickly became clear that that little boy's family was in Canada. And they had desperately been trying to get the rest of their family to Canada. And we had failed them. That hit Canadians hard. It hit our psyche and our mythology about ourselves hard. And we asked ourselves, what do we do about that failure? And almost uniquely, this country being an exception, but almost uniquely among countries, that federal election turned that year on the issue of migration and on the issue of refugees. But it turned in a different way. In an almost unseemly manner, the politicians were bidding against one another, saying, we can take more refugees. No, we can take more. And ultimately, the party that won the election, 25,000 refugees by Christmas, that's in a country of 30 million, by the way. We're very proud of ourselves. It's not a big number. But ultimately, that party won. And we got ourselves set on preparing how we were going to welcome these folks to Canada. And then terrorist attacks happened in France. And almost immediately, the public conversation turned, the public conversation soured, the public conversation got much angrier. There was one day when I was hosting an open house at the Calgary Public Library to talk about how we were going to receive and settle all these refugee families that were coming. And I kind of didn't want to go because the public conversation had gotten so angry that I really didn't want to deal with it. I had answers to all the tough questions, but I just didn't want to raise that conversation in the community. But I took a deep breath. I walked across the street from City Hall to the Public Library and walked into a room it was packed to the rafters. People were standing in the aisles. They were all there. And I looked around the room. And it was full of imams and priests and rabbis. It was full of grandmothers and children who probably should have been in school. It was full of that very unique individual without whom no change happens anywhere in the world, that individual that I call the church lady. And all of them were there with only one question on their lips. I call it the most Canadian of all questions. And it was, how can I help? What can I do? And I remember standing at the bottom of that theater, talking, and a woman at the very top of the theater stood up. And she said, Mayor, I have a question. I said, what's your question? And she said, well, I am a proud indigenous woman from the Blackfoot tribe. And I thought, oh no, I know what's coming. She's going to say, how can we extend our resources on these people from other parts of the world when we have so many problems here? And I had an answer. I was ready, but I kind of didn't want to hear that question. And that's not the question she asked. She said, Mayor, I have a problem. And I said, what's the problem? And she said, 
I have managed to round up enough elders who have the right regalia. I've managed to round up enough young men who are willing to do the drumming. But I don't know when these families are coming. And I said, I have no idea what you're saying. And she looked at me like I was a six-year-old, as people often do, took a deep breath and said, Mayor, these people have been through things that we cannot even imagine, violence and degradation. It is unbelievably important that when they get here to their new homes, they are welcomed with the proper ritual and ceremony. And I'm going to organize it for you, but I don't know when they're coming. And that was probably the first time in my political career that I didn't know what to say. So what I said was, OK. And three months later, we had a giant ceremony in the atrium of City Hall where we had every service provider, every single person who spoke Arabic uh, in the place to help people learn how to use the transit system, to learn how to access the services that were available for them. And I stood on a stage with a Blackfoot elder, and we properly blessed and welcomed these people to their new homes. And I thought to myself at that moment, maybe I don't have to worry about this hardening in the world, about this populism, about this anger and this division and this mean spirit and this, this hatred that we're seeing growing and growing and growing everywhere in the world. Because ultimately, human beings are good. Ultimately, human beings are good. Between 2015 and 2019 in my country, I'm sorry to say that that's not what happened. That in fact, as everywhere, the political discourse hardened. That voices of anger and division and mean-spiritedness and hatred grew louder and louder and louder. And that in fact, every day, every morning, I feel like the forces that want to tear us apart and pull us down are prevailing over those that want to bring us together and lift us up. We've just finished another federal election in Canada. In contrast to that first one that was about humanity, that was about who we are as a people, this one was about, can I give you 25 more cents in your pocket in terms of tax cuts? This one was about the leader of a major party vowing to cut foreign aid from Canada by 25% for no particular reason other than to say, well, we ought to be spending our money at home. It was an election where you may have seen the prime minister, who likes to think of himself as a force of pluralism in the world, uh, was shown with photos that were not particularly interesting uh, in terms of that promise. But more important, it was an election held in the backdrop of a law in Canada in the province of Quebec that forces people to choose between their faith and their job. Back in 2010, the one time I said that my faith came up twice in that election. One of those times was when a very well-meaning reporter said to me, do you think Calgary is ready for a Muslim mayor? And she was trying to tell a nice story. She had the best of intentions. But I was shocked at the question. And I said to her, you know, Growing up in this city, I never for one minute thought there was any job that was closed to me because of my faith. Well, except maybe rabbi. Now, for nearly a quarter of the Canadian population, you may not be a teacher. You may not be a judge. You may not be a police officer. If you happen to be a Muslim woman who wears a hijab, or a Sikh man who wears a turban, this in a country where one of our major party leaders is a Sikh man who wears a turban, or if you're a Jewish man who wears a yarmulke. There are jobs you cannot do. The law, of course, is a piece of blatant Islamophobia, and it's flagrantly unconstitutional. And the other reason that the other two groups were included was to make it look like it was religiously neutral, to make it look like it's about laicite, secularism. Of course, it is exactly the opposite. It is not separating church and state. It is demeaning some faiths while promoting others. And in this federal election we just had, all of the party leaders mouthed platitudes about how that's not a good thing to do, and then were extremely firm in saying, but we're not going to do a thing about it, because we need the votes and the seats in that province. 
In my own part of Canada, this great country that is so successful by any measure, I live in the West. Western Canadians feel, and it's by the way, it's a very big country, six time zones. And where I live in the Rocky Mountains, people feel that they haven't been heard by the federal government. And we have the beginnings of a separatist program, which without any irony whatsoever, they're calling Wexit, West Exit, because Brexit is going so very well. <laughs> and we're starting to see division. When I ran for re-election in 2017, I received more racist comments and threats than in my previous two elections combined, times 10. And so I often ask myself, what kind of walls are we putting back up? What kind of walls are we putting up that are separating us from one another? When did that question, how can I help, become the question, how can I help my own? How can I help my own people? And what do we do about that? How do we respond if we're lucky enough to be politicians who have microphones or if we are, as we all are, everyday people with our everyday hands and our everyday voices, what do we do? And I don't always know the answer to that question, but I have to tell you, just before I came to the airport, day before yesterday to come here, I almost missed my flight because I had the opportunity to meet a young woman named Salam. Salam means peace in many languages. Salam is from Eritrea. She grew up in a small village with no internet, no electricity, and one small library. Somehow there was an Eritrean English dictionary that she used to read. So she learned English words, but she had no ideas how to put them together, or how to make sentences, or how the words were pronounced. Salam's father, who was in the military, had to flee the country because of political persecution, leaving Salam's mother all alone with their six children. Because her father had left, her family was being hunted by the authorities. Her mother, trying to defend her children, kept them shop shepherding them from town to town, city to city, to keep them safe for eight years. Eight years later, they were in a position to try and flee Eritrea and make it to Ethiopia. For five days, with children ranging from five to 11, Salam's family hiked 148 kilometers all at night, no food, no water, to try and escape the oppression they had experienced. On the third night, they were attacked by a pack of hyenas. Salam's mother, in order to keep her children calm, said, don't worry children, I grew up among hyenas, they're more like pets. Salam, as the oldest, knew that wasn't true, but it comforted the young ones. The mother, armed only with a flashlight with a dwindling battery, managed to keep the hyenas at bay, and they amazingly survived. They were captured. Her mom was abused by prison guards. And every night, mom would come back to the family with a smile on her face and say, my daughter, one day you will be a great leader. Salam and her family managed to escape Eritrea. They landed in a refugee camp in Ethiopia for three years, where miraculously, they were able to speak to their father again. They found out he'd gone to Sudan, Libya, Tunisia. In his own refugee camp, he was able to come to Canada. He finally sponsored his family to come to Canada. Now, that would be an extraordinary story in and of itself, except for what happened next. Salam, 14 years old, landed in Canada. She was told it would take her four to five years to graduate high school because she didn't speak a word of English except those words she had learned in the dictionary. She said, nope. That's not going to happen. I am going to get through here. I have to look after my siblings and the rest of my family. And she kept saying when she was telling me this story, the same words, only I can stop me. Only I can stop me. With almost no ability to speak, read, or understand English, she discovered the public library. She spent every day at the public library. She read everything she could. She taught courses, and as she tells me, she watched endless amounts of YouTube videos to learn how to speak English. She had access to these tools in an unbelievably beautiful building in Calgary because everyone deserves beauty, and it was free, and she was there. 
She graduated high school two years later with honors. She's in university now studying psychology because she said, the one thing I have to do is work on mental health for newcomers and make sure that everyone feels welcome here. She met another guidance counselor. She told that person about her dream and he said to her, Salam, you are amazing and you are capable. And this is the best advice she'd ever received. Through another, with another refugee friend that she met through the local YMCA, she started a program called the Newcomers Club, where young people who've just come to Canada work with young people who've just arrived to show them how to navigate high school, figure out how to use a locker, understand how to choose their courses, and oh yes, links to YouTube videos where you can improve your English. And then I realize that when I worry about those forces of anger and fear and mean-spiritedness and bitterness that are tearing us apart, that human beings can bring us together. That ultimately our job, whether we're politicians, whether we're professors, whether we are just people who live in the community, our job is to make sure that on the lands that we are fortunate enough to live, that we strike out against these forces every minute we can. That we make ourselves a very, very simple promise. And that promise is that anger and mean-spiritedness and fear and division can never, never, never win. That kindness and compassion and mercy and service and love always, always, always win. And if there's any lesson we can take from those pictures of jubilant people with sledgehammers on November the 9th, 1989, let us remember that story and let us dedicate ourselves to kindness and service and mercy and love and breaking down walls. Thank you all. Thank you. So it's very, it's very, very nice speech. Thank you very much. So uh, first, the knowledge is about Calgary, for example. For me, it was Olympic Games, which we. But when I tried to uh, to uh, un uh, learn deeper, I saw that you have a lot of national uh, groups in your city. Mm -hmm. So you have French uh, community, you have Scottish, British, Ukrainian, even, and uh, all these. Oh, of course. We have wonderful Icelandic yes. community, yes. I, I, I think maybe Armenian community also. We do. There, yes. Uh, uh, and, you know, how things happen outside of your city in their own uh, countries or their own cities? Uh, for example, the French Quebec issue for Ukrainian situation in Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, for British Scottish egg Brexit. How such things impact uh, impact community life? Do you feel some, I don't know, tension or some difference in their life? And uh, if such, how you, like mayor, solve such problems? Thank you. Such an interesting question. So to just give you a brief precis, Calgary is about 1.3 million people. It is the third largest city in Canada. Uh, nestled at the foot of the Rocky Mountains uh, in a place that traditionally is very conservative in its views and its voting and so on. It is nonetheless uh, a city where about one in three people are not white, where nearly half people are immigrants or first generation people. So we literally do have every single thing in the community. I always joke that I live in the least diverse neighborhood in Calgary because everyone is South Asian. And so, yes, you can get food from anywhere, even Icelandic food. 
uh, in the community. But what's really interesting is exactly this question you ask, which is how do we navigate those tensions from other places? And uh, there's so many places I can go with this. But one of them is, you know, for example, I was speaking recently at a Pakistan Independence Day celebration uh, to the Pakistani Calgary community. And I said to them, you know, I can hear you say Pakistan Zindabad, but I will also say to you that it is your job as people who are lucky enough to live in a liberal democracy to export these values of pluralism back home as well. You know, every single day in front of City Hall in our because we're very Canadian, we have designated spots for protests. <laughs> and every day in front of City Hall, outside of my office window, there is a group of people protesting something else that is going on in the world. Lately, it's a lot of people from Hong Kong, a lot of people from Turkey on both sides of the Kurdish uh, discussion and so on. But what I really find interesting is that people can continue to have these discussions, but they're able to do so in a place that is safe to do it. And I think that's important. You know, there was an incident in the 2015 election, uh, which I shouldn't get too deeply into, but it was very clear that one of the political parties was trying to stir up anti-Muslim sentiment in different immigrant communities. Because, you know, they, they reasoned, well, Sikhs don't like Muslims in India, therefore they shouldn't like Muslims in Canada. Hindus don't like Muslims in India, therefore they shouldn't like Muslims in Canada. So they attempted to stir up some anti-Muslim sentiment within the South Asian community. And they made a terrible error because they didn't realize that here in Canada, the Sikhs and the Muslims and the Hindus are all united because they all eat the same food. And so as a result, trying to stir up neighbor against neighbor really didn't work. So can Canada be an example of pluralism and tolerance and how we work together? Well, that's a subject for a whole other speech. But I certainly think that we're navigating it in a way and in a place where I'd rather be doing it there than anywhere else. Hello, good morning. Thank you so much for your stories, your lessons, and uh, also uh, congratulations for your position. It's really a pleasure to have you here as a speaker. I'm Diego, I come from Brazil. I'm a professor of international relations at the Federal University of Goiás in a city called Goiania, next to the capital city of Brazil, Brasilia. And I wanted, to, so, um, I wanted to resort to your uh, particular, very distinguished contribution as a professor and also as someone from our hemisphere because the conception we have about nation and nation state is totally different mm -hmm, from those mm -hmm. that are here. And um, so this, I, I would refer to just very specific question, what do you understand about uh, nation and nation states? as for understanding neo-nationalist movements and, uh, of course, based on the assumption uh, that just as Canada, Brazil has also a very multinational uh, constituency and, and like uh, 16 million German descendants, more than 10 million Japanese descendants, many uh, million Arab descendants, and also m many more Portuguese and African descendants um, that constitutes 210 million inhabitants. And we call this a country, a nation state or whatever. And uh, many people here in Europe should uh, learn more about this empirical experience that happens in our hemisphere because it's very particular to understand with this concept and understand nationalism. Oh, what a, what a great question. Do I have another hour? No, probably not. Maybe a minute. I think that you've really put your finger on something that we are struggling with everywhere in the world right now. And you know, in Canada, we would never say the words, but we often would think of ourselves as post-national, as a place where everyone is welcome. But what we've really seen uh, as we echo and mirror the rise of populism around the world is precisely the fault lines that are being created. What is ironic to me is that the history of Canada is thousands and thousands and thousands of years long. And Everyone who is concerned about the nation state in Canada comes from a family that has been in the country anywhere between 50 and 100 years of those thousands and thousands of years. So anyone who came more recently than 20 years, anyone who was there more than 100 years ago doesn't count. 
just that small bit of history in between. And I think that ultimately is the fracture line where such uh, conversations will have a lot of trouble succeeding moving forward. But it is very true that people are feeling threatened about their way of life. That's why we have a law in Quebec now that is ostensibly about secularism, but actually is about protecting the public square from those who are different. And I wish I had the answers. I think it is very, very challenging. But I think ultimately, when we tell about stories like Salam's, when we humanize the conversation, when we talk about how the top graduate in the education faculty at the university in Montreal happens to wear a hijab and now cannot teach her children even though she was the medalist in the faculty, that's where people start to break down. And I think that one of the reasons I was excited to come here today is because this whole concept of cultural diplomacy, it's a very fancy term for what I say is about getting people to talk to one another as human beings. And ultimately, I know it's a naive and uh, very sweet sounding sentiment, but ultimately I think that's the answer, is that we have to get people to relate to one another as human beings without the baggage that comes around it and relate to these universal values. I often say that the reason my city succeeds is because we don't care what you look like or where you come from or how you worship or whom you love. We don't care what's on your head, we care what's in your head and we want to give you an opportunity to succeed. And I think relating back to those kinds of values is ultimately what we need to do. But it's hard. We have feckless politicians all over the world who know that they can get a bunch of short-term political gain by appealing to people's baser instincts. And the question is, once that monster is out of the closet, how do you put it back in? Now let's give one person. Yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, one, uh, I'll take them both and I'll answer them really fast. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you for the uh, present uh, speech. Uh, for those, maybe uh, yesterday I, I had a speech, um, I'm mayor also from prison in Kosovo. And um, uh, basically, you had uh, uh, told us that in last uh, elections you had 10 times more racist uh, comments and these kind of things. And um, my speech yesterday was also about 1980s, 1990s in Yugoslavia where Milosevic took power. He used media first to demonize uh, Croatians, Bosnians, and Albanians, and then the war started. And, um, uh, in, and one woman in, uh, uh, who lost his uh, children in, in, uh, in Srebrenica, uh, I heard uh, saying that she said, uh, we were first killed by the media, and then came the army. Uh, so uh, basically, I think that uh, here the question for maybe for Canadian uh, state, uh, I think now this spread of populism is based m mostly based on social media, content, hate speech, fake news, prejudice, and uh, it's much more easier to do uh, this kind of campaigns in the social media, and uh, and, and there is no you know, repercussion for those who initiate any fake news or, or hate speech. Uh, and uh, is there any legislation going on in Canada to look at this kind of, th and, and act more speedy manner to control this kind of content in the s social media? Like this is very, very, very dangerous stuff. Uh, when I ran in 2010, uh, one of the things that people got interested in after the whole Muslim thing was my use of social media. And famously I said, we use Twitter as a telephone, not a television. So in other words, it's not about broadcasting information to people, it's about engaging in conversations with people. That is impossible now. I have half a million followers on Twitter and I only use it to tell people when the waste uh, collection schedule is changing. Um, but what I've really come to terms with is the need for us to use these tools as well. There was a vacuum that was created that allowed for this kind of fake news, populism, and so on to take over the social media. So if you spend time on Twitter or reading the comment sections of news sites, God help you, it feels like everyone is incredibly angry. But the experience that I have going day to day talking to hundreds of people every day, as you must as a mayor, is not that. So what do we, what do, we do to use our own profiles and our own tools to be able to counteract that message. And I think politicians need to do it, and I think everyday people need to do it. 
I will tell you that in the 2017 election, we did do an experiment that had to do with using those social media tools, the Cambridge Analytica style things to actually wake up thoughtful, progressive people as well. And you know, we looked at people's social media to figure out tools, whether they were community-minded people, the vast majority of people are, and sent the messages that were much more related to the need to preserve and build community. I hate doing that, it feels almost manipulative, but I think it has to be done. And I think that we have to counteract those negative messages with positive ones whenever we can. Uh, thank you very much for your speech. You know, you paid a lot of attention to immigrants coming to Canada, but I would like to hear a few words about the First Nation and yes. relationship with the First Nation. Happy to do it. So I'm wearing a tie today, which is not um, immigrant indigenous art from my own region. This is from the west coast of Canada. Um, but they have much nicer art than the people in my region, and I don't mind saying that out loud. <laughs> the Act of Reconciliation is Canada's uh, single most important role as a community. Where we have failed as a nation is not in allowing Indigenous people in our community the ability to share in the prosperity of the rest of the community. So for the last five or seven years, we've really been going through a process that we call reconciliation. We set up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to look at the treatment of Indigenous people uh, over generations. Things have changed. For, uh, symbolically, things have really changed. No politician, I did something I, today that I haven't done in years, which is I started a speech without an acknowledgement of the land and the treaty on which we stand. You know, every single public event, including weddings, starts with an acknowledgement of the Indigenous people. That's a symbolic change, but it is, a different, it is an important one that is really helping us think about having the conversation in new ways. And I often say that we are now at the pointy end of the stick of reconciliation because we've done the symbolic things, we've done the respect uh, of one another well, and now we have to get to really tough issues. Why are rates of poverty so much higher in Indigenous nations? Why is housing such a problem? Why are, is the issue of intergenerational trauma and mental health not being addressed? It's a very simple idea here. There are some 60 First Nations in Canada who do not have safe drinking water. If we in Calgary did not have safe drinking water, that would be a national emergency. And the federal government, the provincial government, the municipal governments would be doing nothing else but making sure that the drinking water system in Calgary was fixed. Yet we've allowed nations in Canada to go for decades and decades without safe, clean drinking water at home. This is Canada's greatest shame, it's our greatest tragedy, and it is absolutely critical that we address that. And we've seen other nations in the world do a better job than we can, and we will follow that example. All right, I better stop. <laughs> Thank you all.